Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Regency Society. Um, this evening's event is being filmed, as you've probably noticed, by uh, Hasna Barcia, uh, who is uh, proposing to put it on, uh, on YouTube in due course, so watch out for that. Uh, just a few announcements before we start the business for this evening. Um, the Anthony Dale Lecture tickets are now selling well, so if you want to get tickets, please do so. You can buy them on the way out if you want to pay by cash or by cheque, or you can get them uh, from the website as well. Uh, just to remind you that the, uh, our lecturer for the Anthony Dale Lecture uh, on the 6th of March is uh, Duncan Stewart, who is the Chief Executive, Executive of Historic England, and he's going to talk about the challenge of preserving England's built heritage. So, it might be interesting, you know. Um, tickets cost £12.50, and that includes a glass of wine, which this year, and usually, will not be in the kitchen of the Royal Pavilion. It will be in the banqueting hall. So that's even more splendid than the kitchen. <coughs> I'm not sure why that is, but uh, I think there's something else in the kitchen. Um, I, I want to apologise for the fact that we have had to cancel the advertised lecture for the 3rd of April, which was to be on the architecture of John Denman. Um, the AGM will, of course, go ahead on that date, uh, and I'm very grateful to our membership secretary, Suzanne Hinton, who has offered a talk afterwards. You probably know, some of you know anyway, that she is co-author of a recent book about Regency Square. So um, her talk will be called Behind the Facades, and uh, she will be giving us glimpses of some of the buildings in the square and some of the people who live in them. Um, final thing, if you fancy a chat afterwards, as always, the Prince George in Trafalgar Street is quite a nice place to go. Uh, and I'll now hand over to Kate Jordan, who is going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks, Roger. Um, I'm really delighted to be introducing Kate McIntosh to speak tonight because um, Kate is, uh, as described by Rowan Moore in The Guardian, one of Britain's great unsung heroes of social housing, the architecture of social housing. Um, and I think that quite aptly describes Kate. Kate's work is really quite exceptional. Um, as she, throughout her career, worked with Dennis Lasden. She designed Dawson's Heights, which I hope we'll be having a look at. Um, and she won this internal competition when she was just 27. And now two of, two of Kate's buildings are listed. One, okay, one, <laughs> Liam Court. Dawson's Heights should be listed, but we'll come to that. Um, and, uh, and Kate continues to exert her a very strong influence, and particularly for the younger generations of female architects and architecture students who are now coming to sort of discover Kate's work um, and, you know, she, she, she is really bringing a lot of uh, these issues to right now. But today she's going to be talking about uh, her work in housing and she's also going to be, I think, introducing us to some of the work that she's done in East Sussex, uh, particularly Lewis. Um, and I will stop now and invite Kate to come over and tell you a bit more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, um, very complimentary introduction. Uh, I, would, I would like, in turn, to compliment the um, Brighton Regency Society on your summer newsletter, which I've been reading uh, with enormous interest. It's a piece of quite in-depth research, I think, and uh, completely complements my passion and interest in, in social housing. So, um, on with the... Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, it was in um, 1965 when I joined the Southwark, London Borough Southwark Architects Department, and I was presented with this quite extraordinary site, which is fairly near Dulwich, and um, it's this one of a series of hills which rise at a distance of about four miles away from the south bank of the Thames. And uh, they've all got pretty marvellous views, but I think Dawson's uh, Hill, as it was then called, probably has the best. 
Um, the brief called for um, just under 300 dwellings of varying different sizes. And um, my point of departure for the design was, was twofold. One was to try to exploit these views to the maximum. There's, this is showing the view to the north. In those days, you could see the cranes of the, of the docks. Now you see the uh, um, massive um, towers of the city. Um, and um, the other was the extremely unstable ground conditions, which meant that the whole of the building uh, of whatever height had to be supported on driven piles of 30 meter in depth. So there's almost as much structure below the ground as there is above. Now, those two factors tended to um, argue that the footprint of the building should be limited um, because the foundations were extremely expensive. But um, wishing to exploit the views, and to the south, there's also a marvelous view. Crystal Palace is rather in the foreground, but you can see the, the Weald of Kent uh, and the North Downs. And so I arrived at this solution of um, two staggered ziggurats, which um, are, they're sta the high points of the ziggurats are staggered to um, uh, minimize the blocking of sun and view. And another objective that I set myself was to, uh, I had done a, a vacation work at the LCC um, as a student. And there the, um, the, the general approach to housing was to put the smaller families into tower blocks or slabs and put the larger ones into uh, four-story walk-ups, which produced, to my mind, an artificial separation according to family size. And I wanted to get a more, in my view, natural mix of family size on the theory that um, as um, demographic uh, between families varied, uh, this, so would the needs and uh, capabilities of the families tend to dovetail so that they could support each other. And so um, a sort of social gel would occur. So I um, organized it on what I refer to as a sort of Chinese puzzle of overlapping. Um, these, these are all uh, maisonettes, split-level maisonettes, so you, they all get a view both to the north and the south. Um, and the access ways occur every third floor, um, which uh, means the lifts are more efficient. But uh, you get a one-bedroom, a two-bedroom, and a three-bedroom maisonette all sharing the same access way. And the four-bedroom, which is the green in this diagram, uh, is coming off the lowest access way. And they share it with a two-bed and a, uh, a three-bed. Um, this is a, an interior, a recent uh, shot of young family uh, looking extremely happy, I'm glad to say. <laughs> Uh, that's the father of the family. So you can see it's, um, it's actually a very dense scheme, um, but there's plenty of green around. In fact, the density on, of this development is about four times what is regarded as acceptable in the suburbs of Winchester. So I think in our housing, uh, the housing which is going forward now, we are extremely profligate in our use of land. The, um, in the two ziggurats embrace a central space, which is on about the scale of Tavistock Square, near which I was living at that time. And um, the lowest access way originally bridged across from the lowest part of, of the scheme, which is only three stories. It varies in height from um, uh, 12 stories to three stories. Um, 
so that even the people living in the lowest part of the building could uh, have maximum convenience of using the lift if they were carrying a heavy load. But under the um, edicts of um, Thatcher's advisor on housing, uh, uh, whose um, mantra was that uh, connectivity and permeability, which we had regarded as desirable objectives, were uh, leading to um, social problems. And uh, when the, the development was um, made over to Southern Housing Group by Southwark, they, in their wisdom, decided to remove the bridges, which I regret, uh, because they also gave an additional sense of containment to the central space. Um, so uh, Alice Coleman is the, is the name of the woman I'm talking about. All of this was built to Parker Morris standards, which um, the, the Homes for Today and Tomorrow report was actually published under Macmillan, which... Uh, the current go government uh, prefers to ignore. And it was one of Thatcher's first acts in coming to power was to scrap the Parker Morris standard because uh, the volume house builders, the supporters of the Conservative Party, um, resented the fact that they were not able to build to that space standard and make the profit that they considered they were entitled to. And consequently, of course, we have the smallest houses in Europe. Um, so um, the central conundrum, in my view, in the building of bulk housing is to strike a balance between privacy and conviviality. And um, architects always try to... Uh, encourage conviviality. It's not something you can force, but you can encourage it and provide opportunities for it. And this is the very aspect that um, Alice Coleman uh, found objectionable. Um, so um, the making over of the development to um, so Southern Housing Group did have one benefit in that they decided to designate the lower slope um, which is facing north, uh, as a nature reserve, because it was deemed to be economically totally unbuildable. And um, that is quite the best use for this space, in my view. And so um, lots of people go there to watch the fireworks on November the 5th, if you have this splendid view. And if you have the opportunity, I recommend that you do this. Um, so in... Um, I left Southwark and I went to Lambeth where I was uh, given a brief for a much smaller scheme. This is um, sheltered housing. Sheltered housing at that time was uh, regarded as the cutting edge, uh, new thinking of providing uh, protected and um, uh, convenient living for the elderly, but with uh, as much independence as they were capable of handling. So this is um, uh, a backland site. It was the garden of a substantial Edwardian property, and um, it was therefore well treed. And um, I set out these cluster blocks from the trees, so not a single tree on the site had to be taken down. Um, so this is the way the buildings appeared shortly after handover. The um, brief called for um, one single person and two person dwellings in the ratio of um, one to three, which allowed me to create these setbacks at first floor level so that all the um, dwellings, uh, first floor, have quite a substantial roof terrace. And the uh, setting back of the dwellings uh, means that the, um, the ground floor also has a semi 
private open space, which uh, I'm glad to say the residents uh, are make uh, are very appreciative of and, and uh, do colonize. Um, it's built in, in concrete block, um, and uh, I, I won't go into all the ins and outs of that decision, be, but um, it, it gives a, a sense of permanence and, and scale to the whole thing, which I thought was, uh, was appropriate for the elderly. This is uh, one of the staircase, the communal staircase, in one of the blocks. So you've got four flats at ground level and four at uh, first floor level. Oh, sorry, whoops, go back. That's uh, a section through the, the communal staircase. So the, the, the landings and approach are, are fairly generous. And um, there is the, uh, these glazed lay lights which allow the light in, uh, plenty of light streaming in. Um, there you see the um, the way the residents were colonising these um, spaces, and so um, Lambeth, in their wisdom, um, decided uh, around 2012, or probably earlier than that, that they would demolish all this of this, and um, I got a a cry for help from one of the residents saying that uh, they, they liked living there, they didn't want to move, and uh, they very much valued the sense of uh, seclusion and a um, uh, little green oasis um, in which they were living. Um, and um, could, I, could I help? How could I advise them? So I advised them to go for listing. and. Uh, Docomomo, a splendid organization of which you may have heard, they put in an application and in 2015 it was listed grade two. So we all heaved a sigh of relief and then uh, about a year after that, um, Lambeth voted one and a half million to spend on putting right the 40 plus years of neglect to which they'd sub subjected this uh, series of buildings, uh, which also seemed to be good news. So what was my despondency and disappointment on returning from a short holiday in the spring of last year to get another cry for help? Kate, Kate, please come on site and see what you can do. Shabby work going on. They're pulling the place apart. And this was the sort of sight that, that met my eyes. And since then, this has almost taken over my life, campaigning to um, put this right. And we've had no less than three public statements from the cabinet member for housing saying that they realized that uh, this is all in contravention, of course, of the listed building protection. It's therefore illegal work for which they, someone ought to go to prison for two years. But... Um, Her Historic England say that in the case of a two-story, um, a, a grade two listed building, they cannot intervene. And the normal process is for the um, conservation officer in the planning department of the uh, authority concerned to issue an enforcement notice. So there's not much hope of Lambeth's conservation officer issuing an enforcement notice against his own employers. And so it goes on. Our only recourse is to try to shame them publicly. This is a, a legal anomaly, a clear legal anomaly. So, turning to happier subjects and times, I left Lambeth in um, 74 and uh, went to East Sussex, Lewis. And uh, uh, Around that time, my partner and I, George Finch, we bought a, a property in um, North Tuscany, una casa rustica, um, where we were extremely happy. It was a very dilapidated property, but we had a lovely time. So in um, exploring North Tuscany, I was very struck by the 
very simple but perfectly proportioned um, Romanesque campanile of the traditional Roman um, uh, Romanesque architecture. So my first job in East Sussex was for a fire station in Hastings. This is the Ridge, um, Holton Fire Station. And um, so thinking of uh, Kevin Lynch and others, I thought, well, architects these days don't really often get an opportunity to build a tower. And uh, a landmarks are terribly important. Um, so why should a drill tower always be such a, a terribly uh, uh, banal and um, t utilitarian <coughs> object? It, it could be something a bit better. So this, this was my attempt to do something a bit more interesting. Um, this is uh, uh, the, the little construction at the base that's for repairing hoses. Um, the aesthetic problem of um, fire stations, which are quite complex buildings, um, in my view, um, is the uh, how do you avoid a, a duality between what is essentially a, a quasi-domestic stroke administrative building and what is essentially uh, pretty much an industrial shed. Um, and uh, you don't want to just have two boxes jammed up against each other. So my solution in this case was to um, envelop the whole thing in a roof, a big roof. And um, the, this, this roof is of, of zinc, which uh, actually uh, stands up quite well to a saline climate. Um, my next uh, job for the fire brigade was um, in deepest rural Sussex, Maresfield. Uh, this is um, a fire brigade training headquarters. And as you see, this is a seven-story drill tower rather than a five-story. So um, in deepest rural Sussex, uh, I didn't want to offend the uh, um, uh, sense of uh, the Arcadian green, etc. So I wanted the f drill tower, this huge drill tower, to be as discreet as it's possible for a seven-story drill tower to be. And I therefore located it adjacent to this uh, huge oak on the, on the site. Um, the, the other building you see beyond with the um, tile hanging, that was uh, the ablutions, as they call them, the showers, the locker room, and there's also a lecture theatre um, where they can simulate on a small scale different sorts of fires with a, um, a little chemical lab uh, type situation. And within the firehouse, which is at the base of the drill tower, um, they put the trainees through absolute purgatory. Uh, they um, have to fumble around in the dark. Uh, maximum humidity is completely smoke-logged. And there's a maze of obstacles with doors of different ironmongery on them and, and so on. Uh, this is all monitored by remotely with audio equipment and if one of the trainees panics and rips off their breathing apparatus mask they bang on the extract fan and uh, the um, go in and rescue them. So um, I can tell you that doing this gave me immense confidence and uh, respect for the fire brigade. Uh, this was my last job for the Fire Brigade of uh, East Sussex, which is, um, or was at that time, the communications headquarters in Lewis, right onto the River Ouse. And uh, I'm glad to say it's still there. Uh, <laughs> I went and had a look yesterday and it seems to be in pretty good nick. Uh, but I think the use has changed. It's probably um, all the emergency services because there was a, a van parked outside with a big red cross on it. It's in front of, um, uh, or between the Lewis fire station and the river. So the drill tower you see here is not by me. Um, 
So when I went to Hampshire, which was in 86, uh, I also got a fire station to do. And this is um, the largest fire station I've done, which is um, a five-bay station with the possibility of a future extension to six. And there's uh, spare appliance bays as well. It's on the edge of Farnborough Airfield, where the um, Farnborough Air Show takes place. And so there is the possibility of a major incident uh, requiring the services of this, um, this uh, particular branch of the fire brigade. Um, so once again, I was preoccupied by the problem of how to achieve unity between these disparate parts of um, the building. Um, and you could divide a fire station functions into a series of opposites. There's um, highly regimented and um, relax and socialize and bond, which is very important because, of course, they have to absolutely trust each other in situations of extreme danger. Um, uh, there's um, clean and dirty, there's noisy and quiet. Um, so the quiet activities are all on the first floor. Um, as a big lecture theatre, um, and um, the, this is the frontage onto the road. Um, a dormitory, so 15-man watch, um, uh, and the officers have... Um, a separate dormitory. And this is um, the pole drop. The cruciform in the structure, um, I located the pole drop at that, the center of that cruciform. Um, and uh, this is the muster bay that you see on the left-hand side there. Uh, the fire brigade pride themselves on um, a three-minute turnout from sleeping rest. And the pole drop, um, to my mind, serves a very good function other than getting them there with the maximum speed in that it wakes you up like nobody's business. <laughs> um, so this shows the, uh, on the left-hand side is a pair of appliance bays uh, so this is, falls into the category of the disciplined, regimented. And on the right-hand side, that is looking at the, um, um, the mess room um, with uh, the, the lecture room above. Of course, um, means of escape in case of fire, in the case of a, a fire station, have to be absolutely uh, as good as it gets. So therefore, the two, the two staircases. Um, now, this is uh, just comparing the, uh, the three designs for drill towers um, uh, as they developed. So it's uh, a rare privilege I had to be able to explore all that. Now, this is um, the one um, scheme that I did in Brighton, which um, is uh, 251... 253 Preston Road. Uh, uh, this is for social services. Uh, and these two uh, very grand double-fronted Victorian villas um, were, one of them was in a terrible state. The one on the left-hand side was uh, dry rot and uh, the windows were all boarded up. Um, the brief was to provide uh, a children's home, um, residential, but also a family center. Um, so in order to give maximum recognition to these very dignified Victorian villas, I suppressed the new accommodation to um, a, a very subordinate scale, uh, but it, it nonetheless links the two. Um, so that that was uh, this is an exercise in contextualism, you could say. Um, so this is it at the end of the day, and um, it got a 
Civic Trust commendation. Um, uh, it, it may not any longer be um, serving this function. It's probably sold up and converted for housing by now, for all I know. But uh, that was what we were doing. The ramp uh, down to the family centre is to allow uh, parents in wheel with wheelchairs or indeed mums with buggies to get down. Um, so um, then um, I moved to, uh, I'm back in Hampshire now. This is um, to the north of Portsmouth. It's um, uh, a replacement primary school, no, uh, infant school. Um, it, it, the, the school was in existence, but it was operating entirely out of temporary classrooms. Um, and so the, the staff, the head, the children on the roll were all in place, which was ideal for me because I had a user client to relate to. And um, the head and I, we toured around various of Hampshire schools recently built, and she could tell me what she liked and what she didn't like and, and so on. It was a wonderful dovetailing of um, uh, collaboration. Um, it's on the site of uh, a Victorian reservoir, which was of an oval shape um, and had been infilled. So um, the foundations were short bore piles to get through the fill, which meant that... Um, whoops, slow response here. Um, I could um, jetty out... Uh, at, at no increased expense uh, and provide a teaching deck to the south. So all the classrooms face south. Um, and um, what you see on the right here is the, um, uh, the school hall, and um, which is a gym, of course, and also serves for um, uh, meals. Um, and... Um, the ground rises from this playground that you see here to a ridge above where there is a, a fort dating back to the Napoleonic Wars, Purbeck Fort. So if you ever in Portsmouth, if you want to go and see the school, ask for Purbeck Fort. Um, so the, one of the criteria I always judge a building by is are the entrances easily identified and uh, obvious. Uh, in this case, there are two entrances. One on the right-hand side is uh, sort of the official entrance where parents and uh, governors and uh, indeed the staff would enter, uh, visitors, and off shot to the right is the secretary's office so she can monitor all the comings and goings. But the children enter under the building. Um, and the head's office is above this underpass. And she can get out on the teaching deck if she hears a fracas and just let those kids know that they're being supervised. <laughs> so this is on the right hand side here you see the teaching deck. Um, substantial roof overhang so there's uh, no um, problem with solar gain and I like to uh, make the structure of uh, the way buildings are put together uh, very clear and obvious so the building itself speaks to the child and they can understand how it's all put together uh, on the left hand side here you see the interior of the hall um, that huge window also looks south, so you get views of the sea. You can see all the way to the, um, the port of, of Portsmouth. And um, the, the stagger in the plan of the classrooms, um, the, the corridor widens out, and that is where the school library, as we used to call it, but now it's called the central resource, is located. So all the children pass by these um, 
uh, wonderful books and uh, it's perfectly accessible to them. They know where it is. Now then, uh, it's another exercise in contextualism. This is also in Portsmouth. This is a secondary school, a former girls' grammar school. It's um, in Fratton on, on a, an ancient high street. This is not by me. <laughs> this is what I'm relating to. Um, and um, so I had the job of adding a sports hall to this uh, very dignified um, piece of uh, um, Renian Baroque, as it's described. It's listed grade two. In Hampshire, we respect our listed buildings, whatever the grade. Um, and um, so you've probably seen uh, a number of sports halls which are effectively black boxes. And plainly, in relation to a building of this quality, that would be inappropriate. So uh, this was my solution. There's also um, a music suite, which is what you see here to the left, um, which uh, mod modulates the scale and allows the building to relate to the other side of this street is uh, traditional two-story terraced housing. Um, and um, so the, the sports hall is actually a multi-purpose hall. It's used for exams. And it's also let out, uh, can be let out for social occasions. Um, there's some of the detailing. Um, the very tall wall, gable walls, are um, diaphragm walls, so extremely thick, which allowed me to have... Um, timber shutters within the depth of the wall, which plainly have to be closed when there's um, five-a-side football or some, something more um, energetic going on. Um, and to the uh, left here on the upper floor is a viewing gallery, um, and to the right are um, uh, fitness suites. So they, they can either have the window open or closed. The... Um, Head of the sports department in this um, secondary school uh, was a part of the trampolining Olympic team for Britain. So uh, it was uh, terribly important that um, there was sufficient height for her to demonstrate her skills. <laughs> no hitting her head on the trusses. Mm. So th this was partly influenced, I think, because we'd had a, a holiday in, in Ravenna, and I'd been round, um, or we'd together been round the, um, what had been the Roman basilicas, which now converted, or way back in Romanesque times, uh, or perhaps even Byzantine times, to uh, Christian churches. And it struck me how these very simple uh, but huge spaces, they still managed to attain a human scale, and um, I very much wanted to give a human scale to this large space, which I did with these um, semi-engaged columns. So this is the rear of the school. The, the, the area of land on which this school sits is below the um, recommended area for a, a school role of this, uh, for this size. And so the uh, sort of usual problems occurred of the children buffeting each other and uh, a general sort of rough and tumble and hullabaloo. So I wanted to create some places of repose and um, where uh, you could go and, and get away from all that. And this uh, sunken garden was one such. And another was um, this courtyard, which is uh, adjacent to the dining room. The dining room is also below the size that it should be for the role. And when I first um, was handed this brief, this area was simply a quadrangle of packed mud. And um, 
so as part of my brief to try and humanise this, and uh, this was my solution, because they, they were spilling out of the dining room and um, eating their sandwiches or whatever, standing up on the packed mud. It's quite inhuman. And, and here you see it actually in action. <clears throat> so I want to finish with um, uh, the, um, the best and uh, most ambitious job that George and I did together after I took early retirement from Hampshire. Um, and uh, this is um, a charity lottery funded uh, project for um, a poor area of uh, Southampton. It's called um, um, it's, um, this, this is a, a, a steeply sloping site. Um, and when we f first met the, um, the play leader, they were operating out of uh, a couple of Marley precast garages um, with uh, high level windows which covered with wire mesh. So it was a really very alienating environment. But nonetheless, um, in this area which has high unemployment and um, uh, all the sort of problems that tend to go with that, the crime levels were low. And the police put that down to the operation of this uh, playground. So we found the whole way they were um, running this uh, quite inspirational, and we wanted to give it our best shot. Um, so we also um, set ourselves the goal of um, making the building as um, ecologically responsible as possible. Um, so um, this is uh, clad in oak, um, green oak, which is uh, uh, about half the price of um, uh, seasoned oak and, and easier to work. There's certain constraints about fixings and so on, but um, uh, we've investigated all that. So um, it's on. It, it's a peculiarly contrasting site because. On the um, the one side, it's got a 23-storey tower block, which you'll see in a minute, where um, Southampton were dumping their problem families. On the other side, it's adjacent to historic woodland, which runs along the estuary of the um, Solent Water. So it's both Arcadia and... Uh, the obverse. Um, so we um, uh, wanted to design the whole thing so that um, the building itself was an object of play and would invite uh, playful activity. Um, at the same time, the um, staff levels were quite low, so you had to... Uh, facilitate, as far as possible, the um, supervision of, of the play leaders. Um, the site was also uh, quite restricted for the number of kids that they could get in there. They could get 300 um, coming to this playground in school holidays uh, and uh, up to the age of 18. So um, in order to maximise the use of the site, we plateaued it in a series of levels and we jacked the building up off the ground, which created another play space underneath, which could be used in wet weather or um, when it was burning hot sunshine. Um, and uh, so this bridge that you see on the right-hand side is relating to the Made the main play level, and there you see the 23-storey um, tower block. So um, this is the interior, lots of um, storage, terribly necessary for all the equipment, and all of these doors are covered in pinboard. And the raised uh, mezzanine, 
um, platform that allows the kids to get a little bit more secluded. And there's a workbench there where um, donated computers uh, were located so they could hone up their, um, their computer skills, do their homework and whatever. Um, this is the, the gallery running all the way along and uh, these kids really shouldn't be there. That's the toddler's play bit. <laughs> I think they just went there for the photographer. Um, that's the, um, the play leader's office with the corner window and a door so she can get out and uh, see what's going on. And um, this is my last slide. This is uh, someone having a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. Lights, please. fascinating thanks for introducing us to um, excellent and very interesting uh, architecture um, we're going to take some questions I'll come and sit over here Kate, I have many myself but I won't hog you so um, if you have any questions <laughs> Is it very much more expensive to build things, I mean, wonderful buildings, I must say, congratulations, <coughs> but is it any more expensive to build something which is aesthetically pleasing and highly functional than something that's just fits the specifications in general? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Colin Stansfield-Smith used to say that the most important thing is to put in the thinking time. That is the most cost-effective investment you can make is to really work it out before you get on site. And in the present situation, where everything is commodified and the architect is increasingly disempowered and devalued, that is the element which is getting squeezed out. Which raises a question I'd like to ask you, and that is whether you think local authority architecture departments were a good thing, and whether um, the, the move towards sort of private practices has had a detrimental effect on the way we design public buildings. Sorry, could you speak up? It's really hard to hear. That Sorry. Happened. My question to Kate follows on from that, and it's really about whether local authority architecture departments were a good thing for public buildings and for architecture generally. Kate, having experienced both, has some insights, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that um, they, they can both be equally good. Um, and certainly in Hampshire, about 40% of the work was put out to private practice. And the way Colin Stansfield Smith saw it was that there was a stimulus between the public sector and the private sector, that we were borrowing ideas from each other. But once again, with the commodification of everything, um, if we ever get back to a more sensible and responsible and long-sighted <coughs> approach to providing for the needs, not the desires, not the wishes, not the dreams, but the needs of communities, then I cannot see those sort of big, substantial public authorities being reconvened uh, any time soon. But that should not matter, provided you've got enough in-house expertise to intelligently commission. For any um, building to succeed, it's equally important that the client is enlightened 
as that the architect is skilled and dedicated. Yeah. And so long as the number one objective is just to squeeze the maximum financial value out of the site, we will never get there. Any other questions? Questions? Why, you know, the, the track, the one, the building you were listing, why, why can't the, this two, why it's two stories, why, why can't the people, the list building, why can't the historic in, in England intervene? A good question. Presumably, it's something to do with the Act of Parliament. Perhaps if you contact the MP and see if that he can get a private member's bill or something like that. The MP is Chaka Amuna. <laughs> yes. A Blairite. Yeah. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? We talked about the demise of Parker Morris, and I'm old enough to have worked under Parker Morris. Have you seen the latest national standards that bit by bit are creeping into local authority, not in, into local authority planning departments, to minimum sizes? It's not Parker Morris, but the days of the very, very small rubbish mm. could in theory be gone. Mm. It won't be Parker Morris, but it will be mm. Parker Morris minus a bit. Mm. Have you seen the figures? I, I haven't. I 36, know. 36 square metres is one I can remember for a one bed, one person accommodation. Yeah. And in certain LAs, you have to achieve that, otherwise you yes. don't get money. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not as a partial bit of good news. I thought I'd share that with you. Thank you, thank you. You cheered me up. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back Parker Morris. I remember the book with things. Men from above. And, and it was supposed to be the minimum standard. It was supposed to be advanced from there as a base. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, Mary? I suppose I just want to encourage you to explore this notion of commodification. Hmm. Because it seems to me that what you've been talking about is an entirely different approach to providing places mm. for people from the one we so often see mm. in schemes, especially around Brighton and Home, mm. frankly, these days. Mm. All of your pictures, or nearly all of them, are full of people, mm. and people sort of living lives, and mm. the buildings respond to the people, mm. um, and indeed the other way around. Commodification to me, and I'd like to know what you think, <coughs> creates a situation which we have, Mm. Of, of buildings being proposed which only have a northerly aspect and are very close mm. to another building mm. into which they can see directly. Mm. We see that sort of thing and buildings that get very little natural light. Mm. And as for the space around and thinking about the space mm. around, mm. it's desperately lacking. Mm. And there seems to be a, a great tendency amongst people to object to height. Mm. But in fact, mm. you know, your 12-story mm. tower there was, was so humanely placed amongst the surroundings mm. that to me that is the obverse of commodification. Mm. But I want to know what you mean by commodification. Well, um, I would recommend you uh, an extremely interesting book which I'm reading at the moment. It's called The New Enclosure. The um, author is called Brett Christophers and he's a professor at Uppsala University. And um, what he traces is that um, a, a move started already in the mid-70s to um, build up the perception that the public sector, not just um, boroughs, but the NHS, uh, the um, Rail, British Rail, the, uh, the whole caboodle, the water authorities, etc., were hoarding in a completely um, dog-in-a-manger way land that they did not need, land hoarding. And when 
Thatcher came to power, and I actually experienced this to some extent in East Sussex, Heseltine, 1980, demanded that all local authorities should build up a register of their land holdings and should have to justify that they actually needed the land that they owned without any regard to whether that land had a social use, had a social benefit. Was it actually making money? Um, and he builds up this argument, it's very, very carefully researched, that the local authorities were driven, of course, latterly by austerity, that is, you shrink the state, you shrink the functions that are provided by democratically elected authorities. You can then say, well, you don't need this building, do you? You don't need this land because you're no longer doing so much. And this land is then marketed on the open market to the people who are sort of doling money into the Conservative Party. 50% of the floor area of office buildings in the city are owned by foreign companies registered in tax havens. And this movement this shift of, of course, Thatcher came to power saying shrink the state, waving the national flag, we're all patriots, aren't we? They're selling off our country. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have another round of applause for that. Any um, further questions? Two more. <laughs> no, it's just a comment. Um, just to say, I used to work uh, as a social worker in Brighton and used to visit um, Preston Park Children's Centre. Um, there are often riots going on there. Um, <laughs> but I believe, I, I, don't, I think that the centre has closed down now. Yeah. I, I, I believe that the policy now is not to have children's centres. Yes. yes. And in some ways, I think that's rather good. Yes. Um, yeah. In some ways, I think you know the young people need somewhere safe. It, it, if you had the support for families, which allowed them, you know, for, yeah. we all know about single mums being chucked out of private accommodation. And, uh. David, I think you had a question. I, I was going to say, you, you mentioned at one point that we're profligate in our use of land. Mm. I'm not sure whether we are when you think about tiny little apartments in large blocks. Um, but I was comparing that in my mind with Victorian, late Victorian terracing. Mm. Would you, how do you find the balance between going back to that sort of housing and mm. the, some of the very cheap and nasty stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, um, what's been going on around here, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant of, except that I've read your splendid newsletter, as I say. But, um, if you ask a developer, why don't you build terraced housing, which is uh, so eminently popular in places like Brighton, in places in London, and the most expensive housing in London is in terraces, they won't give you the true answer. The true answer is that they want to sell it off unit by unit. And they don't want, obviously, if you had a, um, a grand design like uh, the, the splendid squares of Brighton, if you don't, only got it half built, uh, it, it, it would look very peculiar and odd. It would be obvious that it was an incomplete composition. So they want to build piecemeal. And they want to feed, pay off their borrowing as they go along. So you'll never get a grand composition out of a spec builder. And as for the towers which are going on up in London, I've been up on the viewing gallery of the um, Tate Modern, looked around, I could see 50 cranes. I counted more than 50 cranes. 
These are just a series of logos. They don't have any relation one to another. There, there is n and as for section 106 agreements, they're just a bribe. They're bribed to, to the local authority to increase the density on the site because the more accommodation they get on the site and they're so strapped for cash, they're just greedy for every quid they can squeeze. Sorry, I'm getting what carried away. The, 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 the building that went bust was building the hospitals and things like that in the NHS. Oh, Carillion? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, to go into the deeper into this mire of slough of despond that local authorities are pushed into, there are these things called framework agreements, which is all coming from central government. They are in, more or less instructed that uh, where you've got, as happened in Lambeth, you've got a, a nut, their housing estate, because they neglected it over such time, all coming up for needing renovation. So they bundle all this work together in a framework agreement. The bureaucratic task of tendering for this is so complex that only some big national company can afford to do it. And then they're lumbered with this company no matter how incompetently they perform, like the work you saw being carried out at 269 Liam Court Road, all those pipes, which is illegal, as I say. They would let as what you call design and build contracts. So there was not an architect in sight, not a designer in sight. It was all handled through these Cowboys, I looked up those contractors on the web. Their customer satisfaction survey, everyone was saying, don't go near them. They're absolute cowboys. You'll never get any decent work out of them. And yet, Lambeth were going to them time and time and time again. Kate, uh, it's very noticeable that in all those beautiful buildings you showed us, um, you did not make much use of prefabrication. Uh, and prefabrication, of course, would be very useful for us today mm. in, in our domestic housing, mm. etc. buildings. So, would you like to comment on that? Mm. What should we be doing about prefabrication? Mm. Well, um, prefabrication has uh, moved on a lot since those days. Um, when, at the time we were going for um, government loan for uh, Dawson's Heights, uh, and this was coming from central government, you were being pushed down the road of the big panel systems, industrialized building. And in fact, if you didn't build through an industrialized building system, you had to put some very cogent argument to them as to why not, otherwise you would be penalised. In the case of Dawson's Heights, we could say, well, the ground conditions are so dodgy, you know, if you get the least little bit of movement on this site, you're going to have major structural problems. So they bought that. Um, George, as you know, did these, he pushed industrialised building as far as is possible to go in developing an interesting, modelled and variable uh, configuration. Um, but, I mean, setting industrialised building aside, because that form of industrialised building, which more or less died the death after the Ronan Point collapse. Um, now, Richard Rogers is very keen on pre- um, pack, flat pack almost um, and uh, he's um, got these h homes for um, getting people off the street for the housing for the homeless which um, can be erected very very swiftly and they're to a very good standard 
uh, insulation-wise, um, space-wise. Um, Shelter are uh, working together with him on this. And um, the marvellous thing is you can move them around. They're, they're, they're not terribly heavy. It doesn't take a lot of uh, heavy cranes and things to, to get them up. So, yes, I, I think uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. Design of your social housing, it sounded like you were quite young when you did your first yes. project, especially the 300 dwelling project. Yes. What kind of kept you going and sort of prevented you from being influenced too much by cost restrictions? And... Ah, well, uh, as to um, cost, um, <coughs> you couldn't forget about cost, of course. Uh, the, um, the way the Conservatives would like to uh, depict local government as profligate and irresponsible and uh, uh, not keeping proper discipline control of these things. Uh, there was a measure which was called the housing cost yardstick, <coughs> which was um, uh, reviewed from time to time for inflation. And um, this was put out by the um, uh, Quantity Surveyors uh, Institute as what was the reasonable rate per metre squared in any given area. And London was, of course, the most expensive place to build. So you had to hit the right target on cost, otherwise you wouldn't get consent. There were um, things called abnormals. Um, in the case of Dawson's Height, the abnormals were the foundations. So the, something that's specific and unique to that site you could claim was an abnormal. But when um, I was designing Dawson's Heights, this was the Wilson government, it was a, a Labour government, um, there was a very damaging speech made by um, the then Minister for Housing and Local Government, which was sort of accusing local authority architects of being extravagant and putting in unnecessary fripperies, like balconies. <laughs> Who needs a balcony? <laughs> so I was very conscious that um, unless I could thoroughly justify these balconies, the QS would get out his red pencil out with that. So I designed it so that every single balcony was an alternative means of escape. And they couldn't cut them out. Did you have um, any architects or anything that inspired you at this point in your career? Um, well, I can't catch... Did, was there any, any architects that inspired you at the time? Where did you get your inspiration from? Oh, well, I yes, sorry, I didn't deal with that part of your question. I'd spent two years in Scandinavia. And the, uh, before I came back to this country, I was working in Finland. And uh, the, the, I don't know if you're familiar with Finnish architecture, but of course the, the big name is Alvaralto. Alvaralto. Uh, there was also Pietala. And very, very humane. Uh, um, approach to architecture and quite <laughs> organic and uh, uh, that's probably also partly answering the question is why I didn't want to go down the uh, big paddle system as um, I like the building to feel warm <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry last, last bit of my question if you could go back and give yourself some advice as a younger architect Mm. Um, what, what advice would you give yourself? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a son who is an architect. And um, uh, he's um, working for Arab architects, actually. Um, and uh, there's some of the things, I mean, this is a big national firm which 
does has a very, very good track record. But some of the things he has to put up with would have driven me crazy. Um, be almost all buildings now are design and build, which means the architect do doesn't have full control of the uh, uh, detailing. And even if you're novated, which means that you then become a sort of advisor to the developer, uh, but you're employed by essentially the contractor, so you're not any longer in the service of the client. That's the difference. The, he will get a, um, an email from the contractor saying, I think I found a better, more efficient, cleverer way to do this particular detail. What do you think? Of course, he's only interested in saving money. Now, the only recourse my son has in a situation like that is to say, I don't think that this will conform to the aspirations of the client. <laughs> I suggest you check it out with them. He can't say, forget it, I've thought this through and that's what you're doing. Yeah. Are, you, are you an architect yourself? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I have, I think, um, just to, unless we have any further questions, please do, David. Um, night, I guess, was designed uh, with a strong idea of community. <coughs> In the intervening period, I suppose that a very high proportion of those flats have been sold. About 30%. Only 30? Oh, I'm surprised. It's about a nice balance at the moment. Yeah. And it's a very multi-ethnic community, and they all seem to get on. So that, that sale of houses, of, of units, hasn't invalidated the idea of community? No. They recently started a residence association. I've actually stayed in that flat of which you saw the interior photographs. Oh, wow. Mm. We were discussing um, just before you gave your lecture the, the new initiative, the government initiative, Build Better, Build Beautiful oh. Commission, which um, is being chaired by Roger Scruton. And I wanted to ask you, really, in a nutshell, finally, how would we build better and how would we build beautiful in the, the current conditions, under the current conditions that mm. place so many constraints on mm. us today? Mm. 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 <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, and how do, how do you do that? How do you fight for quality and still keep the uh, commission? Uh, you may, there may be some jobs you've got to turn away. And, um, of course, architects are um, more and more put in the position of fee tendering against each other. Um, and you can only put in as many hours as um, the fee will cover, otherwise you'll go bankrupt. Um, so I just want to put the clock back, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, Kate. That was fascinating, and thank you for answering all of your, uh, all of your questions, your excellent questions, and I think it just remains to give you another <laughs>